Well, friends, welcome to this very special day of worship here, here in our home church at Downsview Baptist Church. I want to especially welcome our members, our covenant members here at Downsview Baptist Church who just week upon week show your love and your care and your concern for your church family by coming together, even though we're scattered in terms of our online services. Perhaps some of you do not have a church family and you're looking. We're glad to welcome you amongst us. And when we're back in live person, we would love to have the opportunity to meet and connect with you. As well, there may be some of you who are cruising around the dial, as it were, just popping in to see a church service somewhere and God in his kindness has placed you right here with us. We're really glad that you've chosen to do that. Please stick with us. We'd love to have you worship and at least watch us and observe us worship the Lord Jesus Christ, we hope, in a compelling way to you as well. But I tell you, friends, the most important welcome today, yes, it's for the moms. A very special and happy Mother's Day to you today, ladies, to the moms out there, to the grandmoms, to the great grandmoms, to the nanas and the omas out there. We want to wish you a very special, special infusion, as it were, of the grace of God, that he might show his kindness to you in such a way that it just sticks and lasts with you and that you just drink in and enjoy his goodness throughout the day today. But we are indeed going to begin our service of worship with the scriptures. So if you have a copy of God's word, I'd encourage you to take it and turn to this magnificent book about the preeminence of Christ, the book of Colossians. Please look there at chapter two, and we'll begin this service as we ask God to focus our hearts and minds on him through his revelation, his revelation of himself. Chapter two, verses eight to 15. Our call to worship today comes from the book of Colossians, chapter 2, beginning at verse 8 and going down through verse 15. Colossians is a book that talks mainly about the supremacy of Jesus, and this passage is part of that discussion. Beginning at verse 8, it says, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, flesh God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Jesus is the best. That's what Colossians tells us. And may God bless the reading of his word. My friends, in light of these marvelous truths that we've had declared and proclaimed for us, let's pray together. Please join me in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, how thankful I am this day that I can know along with my brothers and sisters here in Christ that our God reigns, that he is preeminent over all things, and that despite all of our failings, our shortcomings, our overt sinfulness, that flows from a selfish self-entitlement. I am so thankful, dear God, that the blood of Christ has covered it over. We are as protected in Christ, as it were, as the children of Israel were, as they were inside the ark and all of the devastation happening outside around them, but they were covered in the righteousness and the kindness and the protection of God. 
And we're thankful this morning, Heavenly Father, that we can worship with that protection upon us, with the assurance of that protection, with the peace that comes from the knowledge of that protection. And so I pray, Heavenly Father, that throughout the time that we gather here today, that Jesus Christ would be on display, that Jesus Christ would become all the more precious to us, that you might very well be pleased to open a heart today that has been a heart of stone up until this morning. Make it a heart of flesh. Open it up, dear God. Plant your truth inside it. That truth with the, with the book of James says is able to save souls. We pray, Heavenly Father, we you indeed would show yourself a God who saves, a God who changes, a God who causes us to grow all the more into your image, that you might be all the more honored in our lives. Heavenly Father, we humbly ask that you would do these things this day. In Christ, we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Happy Mother's Day. Today, we're trying something a little different. We're going to sing uh, two hymns together. I'll uh, introduce the hymns, and then uh, Bev will play them, and they'll be up on the screen for you to sing. Let's try this together. The first song we're going to sing is... Amazing Grace, three verses. The second song we'll sing is To God Be the Glory, Great Things He Hath Done.
Well, friends, we do have a few announcements for you here at our church and for our church family. It is our intention to continue to stay online for the next little while. As you know, the stay-at-home order is projected, at least at this point, to be lifted as of the 20th of May. Another way of saying that is that it is in effect till at least the 20th of May. So that means we'll be online till at least the 23rd of May, and we'll make... Uh, the appropriate adjustments after that time. But until then, every Sunday morning at 11 o'clock, Lord willing, we will plan to be here for you. The same place you're watching us now is the same place that you can watch us week upon week upon week. And the best way to find us, and perhaps it's the way some of you have found your way here already today, is Downsview Baptist Church. Dot com. Our church website there has a full media archive session with our other Sunday morning services, our semi-daily emails, the occasional Facebook Live or Zoom call that we may take a video of. But there are often a number of announcements that we'll simply put on video because that's sometimes the easiest way to reach the church. And those of you who perhaps are visiting our church, there is plenty of information about our leadership, about our statement of faith, about who we are and why we are who we are, aspects of our children's ministry when we get things up and running again here. Lots of information on that website. And if you're a church member and you've never gone to our church website, I encourage you to go and have a look, if you would, please. As we say, as far as COVID-19, it is good news and still somewhat frustrating news. Uh, we're not back live in person yet, although I am so grateful. There are so many uh, churches that are just such fine examples of taking a risk, if you will. Our friends at uh, Grace Baptist Church, or Grace Church, Grace Fellowship Church, they're called over here in Rexdale. They have 16 services, only 10 people each, but both of them running at the same time in different areas of your church, of their church, where Public Health Toronto has given them full authority to do that. They can meet safely. They do that four times on Saturday. They do that four times on Sunday. And so that means that between all of those services, four at a time, uh, or at least two at a time, four times a day in two days, 16 services of 10 people over the weekend. Peter Mahaffey down at Royal York Baptist Church has been a real one to start that. Justin Galati at West Toronto Baptist, talking to my friend David Robinson at Westminster Chapel. Uh, they were able to have 10 services over the weekend. They have a very large building and able to transmit it into different areas. And so there's ways to do this. And we're taking a cautious approach for now, but we do hope that when we get back together in the coming weeks, that you'll come and understand that as those vaccine numbers continue to go up, the safety level and safety concerns go down. And so we do encourage you, just like we've been loving our neighbor with our masks, loving our neighbor with our social distancing, obeying the plea from our government to limit our social gatherings, that you would get yourself a COVID-19 vaccine. We live in Canada, the most conservative country in the world. It takes forever for us to get vaccines and medications approved. If it's here in Canada, you can feel safe that you go ahead and take that vaccine. As our friends have been telling us, the best vaccine is the one you get in your arm. And so I wanna encourage you to care for those around you, get beyond ourselves and take advantage. We're here in these hotspots in the down, Downview area, North York area, that there's just the age limit just goes down and down and down and down. And so don't want anybody to take any silly chances. Talk to your physicians, of course. I know I'm not one, but this is simply the message of our Ontario health authorities, and in particular here in Toronto. Get those vaccines in your arm so we can get back together again here at the church. Do your best to hang in there. Ask God for patience and perseverance, but please stay at home as much as you possibly can. It is those social gatherings, those family gatherings that are overwhelmingly the reason why these numbers have just continued to be so staggering these last few months. As far as our church family and the opportunities we've had to connect, we were connecting on Zoom and we've tried it a few different ways. We've gone everywhere from Sunday evenings and we've gone to Sunday mornings 
and we've gone to Wednesday evenings and we've mixed all of that up. And we said last week, let, let's hear from you because our numbers were significantly down on Sunday mornings and then we never really got started again on Wednesday evenings. And you know what? Sometimes these things run their course, but if you would like the opportunity to pray together, to discuss things with your fellow church members here, to be able to connect. And frankly, if you enjoy being a blessing to other people, even if you're not sure you need it yourself, if you enjoy and you find joy in being a blessing, let us know. Uh, send me an email at the church, send me a text, lots of ways to uh, connect with us on the church website. We just want to know what maybe is the best way for us to connect over Zoom. I want to pray together with you today, if I would. Uh, if you would allow me to, to do that, I want to continue to ask you to uphold the Hernandez family. Uh, you know that we have had a day of fasting and prayer a couple of weeks ago for them, both for their health and both for the tremendous medical expenses and the, frankly, expenses that happen from any family being off work for six weeks. And so some of the evidences of grace is Nana, who was in very difficult straits, is home. She got home last Monday, and Ariane, who is a nurse from the Philippines, she's still working on her nursing uh, licensing here, but she knows what she's doing. She told me that she's been watching her oxygen levels, and there's been lots to give thanks for. Uh, Chester, her husband, of course, has been recovered for a few weeks now, but Dad, Emil, these are Chester's parents, Emil and Nancy, and Nancy's mom is Nana, and this Emil is still in very difficult situation. He was actually declining in health for a few days. And so we just want to ask you to continue to appeal to the Lord for his grace and his kindness and his healing hand, and that you continue to uphold them with a sense of thanksgiving. They are clinging to Christ. They are not blaming God. They are not angry with God. They love the Lord Jesus Christ. It's tiring. It's exhausting, but they know who they believed and are convinced that he is able to guard that which they have entrusted to him until the day of Christ's return. So give thanks to the Lord along with them, but please do that. Thank you so much for your incredible generosity, for we know, and it's a bit embarrassing to the family, they said they've just been, uh, had so many people that they just wouldn't have expected, and so much money that they wouldn't have expected donated to them. If you'd like to do that, you can go to the Facebook page, just type in Ariane, or go to my personal Facebook page, you'll see the link there, or Downsview Baptist Church's Facebook page, you'll see that there's a link there for a GoFundMe page, which you can do that directly and have a, a tax receipt for your donation. Or frankly, just let us know. Ariane and Chester are happy to put out their email address. They're very humble about it, but they didn't ask for this. They did not ask for this from us. Obviously, uh, Charmaine, their Chester sister, put out a GoFundMe page for what sounds like some tens and tens of thousands of dollars of potential medical expenses, because Nana is just here on a visitor's visa from the Philippines, and so she doesn't have OHIP coverage. Now, they've asked for that, but we as a church family asked you, if you just want to make a simple e-transfer over to Ariane and Chester, uh, and so many of you have done that. And just, again, I'm just thrilled to see a church family just unashamedly, and we're asking unapologetically, and frankly, you've done it in an uncomplicated way. We're not looking for receipts. We just want to help people. And so we've just sent money over to them and trusting that to the Lord. So keep them in your prayers, and if it is moved, if you are so moved by the Spirit to help them in this practical way, please do that. Now I want to pray for the moms today. We have heard already a number of readings and tributes and, and thoughts throughout the service and that kind of thing about mothers, but we're going to just take a minute to pray for the moms. My historical hero, uh, Charles Spurgeon of course, of course, said, never could it be possible for any man to estimate or to overestimate what he owes a godly mother. And I think that's exactly right. We know that some folks find it not an easy day. We know that some folks are separated from their moms, some by death, some by decision, some by their decision, and some by mom's decision. Some are estranged and it's painful and it's a hurtful memory and this is not an easy day. 
Others, it's painful and misery because mom passed away or mom was the one who did the rejecting and, and you would love to reconcile and she's not interested. And it's hard for you, especially as a Christian person. You, well, who wouldn't want to be reconciled with the person who gave them birth? And we recognize, friends, that there's plenty of, of people who do find this a very trying and almost just choking at your heart to deal with a day like this. And at the same time, friends, we are called to not only weep with those who weep, but to rejoice, to take joy with those who take joy in a day like this. And again, not to apologize for the joy that one feels of knowing a godly mom, a grandmom, a great grandmom, or those, as we said, mother figures who have mothered you over the years and cared and nurtured you, even without the biological connection. So I'm going to ask you to pray with me and to both ask God to care for those who find this difficult and that we would join our hearts and minds with those who really do have much to be grateful for. So would you pray with me, please? Father, thank you for the extraordinary kindness that you have poured out to your people through their moms. Can a mother even forget a nursing child at her breast? And yet, God, you say that even if these forget, you will not forget us. You will not abandon your people. And so the glory of motherhood is how it points to the glory of God. We thank you for that today. I thank you for the moms that come to mind right now. I thank you for the grandmas that are being named. We bless your Name, dear God, for the great-grandmothers that come to mind, for the nanas, for the omas, for those mother figures, yes. As those names just flood into our hearts and minds now, God, we offer them to you and ask that your hand of grace, as it were, would receive them as our praise to you. We do not exalt or praise or worship any mothers but we praise, exalt, and worship the one who has given them to us. And so we unapologetically say thank you. Thank you, Father, for giving us the moms that we have. For those amongst this congregation who are just wonderful pictures of Christ's love. I think in particular of the mother figures that have ministered and continue to care for people in such a significant way, dear God. Your hand reaches out in such amazing ways. And Heavenly Father, you know that tears are shed on days like this for mothers who passed away, for grandmothers who've gone on before, for great grandmothers who are with the Lord, for those, dear God, that are separated not because of death but because of decisions hard heart aching decisions some that are regretted and some that are sadly and miserably clung to some where there are cries for justice and demands for fairness and some where there dear god is just a longing and an aching to be reunited back together with moms I pray, Heavenly Father, you might do a work of grace and of healing this day, that you would do so, Heavenly Father, in such a way that it would be very clear that it is your grace at work. And dear God, we ask that you would help today in that mixture of sorrow and joy that so many surely will be feeling, that your grace would minister deeply, that we would recognize your hand of kindness that we would not only notice it, but what we would celebrate it. That we would look to you this day, dear God, where we lift up our eyes to the hills. When we ask, where does our help come from? We may say mothers, but we know it's because those mothers point to the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. The one who cares for us day and night, when we sleep or when we are awake, the one from whom all blessings flow. We ask, Heavenly Father, you would hear our prayer to the end that you'd be honored, especially in the lives and in the relationship of those lives with moms this day. We humbly ask these things through Christ. Amen. Mother's Day. 
an article by David Mathis. Mother's Day is a sweet opportunity for Christians to celebrate God's common and redeeming grace. For most, there is some bitter flavor somewhere. We live in a fallen world. All mothers are sinful. Even Jesus' own mother knew well her need for a savior, as seen in Luke chapter 1, verse 47, and for God's mercy, as seen in Luke chapter 1, verse 50. Whether your own mother monumentally failed you, or you are a mother who is all too aware of how you failed your children, there is goodness and grace to acknowledge and appreciate in almost every situation, even when deeply tarnished by sin. For many of us, our hearts soar in thanksgiving when God brings to mind our mothers, wives, and grandmothers. Among those of us raised in believing homes where our parents were faithful in teaching and modeling the faith, we have the precious privilege of fulfilling Proverbs chapter 31, verse 28, which reads, Her children rise up and call her blessed. The English Baptist preacher Charles Spurgeon knew something of the privilege of a godly mother. A few of his thoughts are as follows. I am sure that, in my early youth, no teaching ever made such an impression upon my mind as the instruction of my mother. To any child, there can never be one who will have such influence over the heart as the mother who has so tenderly cared for her offspring. Never could it be possible for any man to estimate what he owes to a godly mother. Whether Mother's Day for you is bittersweet or just plain sweet, perhaps the single most significant thing to celebrate in a Christian mother is her ability to bring the scriptures near to her children. On this special day, we echo the message of Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7, which states, Remember your mothers, especially those who spoke to you the word of God. Today I'm sharing thoughts by Courtney Doctor in her article, Let Joy and Sadness Mingle This Mother's Day. Mother's Day. Few holidays can rival it for emotional highs and lows. Sometimes it feels like the whole world is celebrating the holiday, but sometimes Mother's Day can be excruciating for those who have lost a child, who are estranged from a child, who cannot have children, and whose mothers are dying or were abusive. In those situations, the holiday can intensify the pain. How then should we treat Mother's Day? Ignore those hurting, go on celebrating, or suppress the celebration in hopes of lessening the pain around us? Should we even be surprised that such intense joy and sorrow are wrapped up in motherhood? Let's look at the big picture. In Genesis 1.28, we learned that motherhood was actually part of Eden. God told Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply. But the couple sinned, resulting in pain with motherhood, not just the physical multiplied pain of childbirth, that's in Genesis 3.16, but all the emotional pain and the brokenness that surrounds motherhood. Eventually, Christ would come, born of woman, to bring salvation to his people, and to break the curse. Until then, and beyond then, motherhood continues to be a mixture of great joy and tremendous pain. On this Mother's Day, weep for yourself and for those you love who mourn over infertility, miscarriages, abortions, wayward children, and other consequences of the curse. But at the same time, rejoice for every good and right in motherhood that shines as a testimony to God's goodness, His mercy, and His redemption. Celebrate life, extol the praiseworthy deeds of the moms around you, and praise God that He will one day, finally and fully, set everything to rights and wipe every tear from our eyes. I 
wondered where I'd be today If Jesus had not come this way To bring salvation to my sin-sick soul In Satan's net I would be caught And to a sinner's grave be brought But Christ has saved me and has made me whole Because he came, my heart is fully changed Because he came, my life is rearranged Because he came, I love him and adore Because he came, I'll serve him evermore The price he paid at Calvary to save a sinful wretch like me Could not be fathomed through a million years But though I cannot search the love That brought my Lord from heaven above I'll serve him though it caused me pain and tears Because he came my heart is fully changed Because he came My life is rearranged Because he came I love him and adore Because he came I'll serve him is now a joy a new song doth my tongue employ since I've been cleansed from all my sin and shame and when I'm caught up in the air to live with Christ forever there I'll thank him that to earth for me he came because he came, my heart is fully changed. Because he came, my life is rearranged. Because he came, I love him and adore. Because he came, serve him evermore. Well, friends, as we come now to our opportunity to grow in grace, to grow by the very means that Jesus prayed we would grow, the night before he died, he prayed for you and I, sanctify them by your truth thy word is truth that's what our bibles are that's what they contain let's ask god to do what his son prayed would happen this very morning father help us now to live a life worthy of your grace keep our hearts and guard our souls from the evil that we face you are worthy to be praised with our every thought and deed. O great God of highest heaven, glorify your name through me. We pray through Christ. Amen. You know, examples are tricky things, aren't they? We've been spending the last couple of weeks thinking about examples in the scriptures. It struck me this week that as Pam and I had an opportunity to get a new vehicle. Now, we never get new vehicles, but new to us kind of vehicle. Our friend Jonesy, back in Sault Ste. Marie, is a 
brother of ours who's helped us get a number of our vehicles. Both of our boys are driving vehicles, as are we, that Jonesy helped arrange for us and called us the other day and said he had a great opportunity for one. And Pam and I looked at each other and said, well, our, our car is fine. It's getting a little bit older. The mileage is getting up there a little bit. Maybe it has a significant trade-in value now. Maybe if the price is right, it's the right time. So we waited for a little while. Jonesy had to talk to a couple of other friends. And you know, isn't it amazing how once you think you're going to get rid of your car, <laughs> you start to notice the little annoyances that you're glad you're not going to have to put up with anymore. <laughs> oh, the seat isn't quite as comfortable as I'd like. Oh, you know, the, 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 the way the radio knobs are, they're, they're, I've just really never liked how I have to reach for them in a certain direction. You know, there's always been something about that hatchback that doesn't quite close the way I'd like it. You know, every once in a while I think, you know what I'm saying? As soon as you think you've got a better one, the one that you had that wasn't a problem, well, now you start to see its flaws. Well, you know, examples are like that as well. You have a good example of how to live a Christian life. And, and, and things are going along well, and you've got a lot of good instruction, and those examples are helping you get from A to B. Then you see someone else. You go to a conference. You, you get the new study Bible. You get a new preacher on YouTube, which you can see plenty of people that you can trade up from here, I tell you, friends, and I can show you the brothers to listen to. But there's so many other examples out there. Before you know it, you go, oh, yeah, GR pastor doesn't do this. My example of how to live a Christian life doesn't do that. I've noticed flaws in my friends who were Christian people who were helping me get along. And before you know it, all those other folks somehow get pushed aside because that example is a new one. And somebody else comes along and says, hey, look, got a deal for you. Got a good trade in on that old example. Now, Pam and I didn't end up getting our new car just yet. Jonesy's going to figure out something. It, deals begin and they kind of fall apart. So what? Big deal. We're, we have a car. It works. We're, we're great. But, you know, godly examples can be a little more tricky because once the new one comes into your life, it really can seem to overtake the last one. And the reason that it becomes such a problem is we don't often think of people as helpful examples but they almost become idols to worship. They almost become perfection when it was just better than the last one. Or it doesn't do everything exactly right, but this person helps us do something right. And before you know it, we're just searching for the next one and the next one. And when we look for perfection in our examples, what do we find? Not just imperfection, we find disappointment. We find frustration and discouragement. And we look back and we realize that the example that we've been setting is, is just not the kind of example that's going to help us or anyone else. And so when the Apostle Paul offers godly examples, as he has the last few weeks in Philippians chapter 2, we had Timothy and Epaphroditus, both of whom were imperfect but compelling examples of how we should seek to have this mind in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, back in uh, chapter 2 of the book of Philippians and verse 5. But you see, this issue about examples really comes to the fore, doesn't it? If you just look over at chapter 3 and verse 17, the Apostle Paul says, Brothers, join in imitating me. That's the first command. And keep your eyes on, that's the second command, on those who walk according to the example that you have in us. The Apostle Paul says, listen, you join in together in imitating me. I'm an example for you. Look at me and imitate this. Secondly, then, keep your eye on other people who are already doing that. None of which is offered as a perfected or a perfect example but a genuine and helpful example. You remember Timothy, of course, as we saw last week, was really a man that we 
only hear a little taste about here, but you know how he was such a, a member of Paul's missionary team uh, throughout Timothy's time with the Apostle Paul. And if you look at uh, chapter 2, verse 19 to 23, you notice how the Apostle Paul speaks of, of Timothy, that, that I hope in the Lord to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by news of you, for I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Christ Jesus. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father, he served me in the gospel. And so I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I will come myself also. You know, you must ask yourself, as I do, if... Timothy, who the Apostle Paul met on his journey, had certain aspects of character that Timothy found compelling. From where did he get that? And on a Mother's Day, I want to encourage you to look over where we see this revealed in Paul's second letter to Timothy. So that was a letter to the church at Philippi, and he wants to send Timothy to them. But at the end of the Apostle Paul's life, he writes what we know is his very last letter. And he writes it from prison, from jail. He writes it to Timothy. And he writes him to encourage him in the example that he had. Not a perfect example to be sure, but the example that he had for the life and the character that he developed. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 1, Paul an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. I thank God whom I serve as did my ancestors with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. Verse 4 says, as I remember your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. And I am reminded of your sincere faith. Speaking to Timothy, I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. Brothers and sisters, on a Mother's Day, when we take the apostles' call clearly to join in imitating me and to keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us, if Timothy received his example from Paul, but Timothy received an example even in his own character from Lois and Eunice, mother and grandmother, then they are exactly the kind of example that we should keep our eye on. And yes, on a Mother's Day Sunday, we think to ourselves, what kind of godly example did Timothy have in his mom and his grandmom? that would cause the Apostle Paul to see something of Christ in him, frankly, before Timothy even saw it himself. I want to encourage you this morning, dear friends, not so much as we have the last couple of weeks, to seek the, man of, the mind of Christ in the man of Christ, or to seek the mind of Christ in the people of Christ, but do not seek, but see the mind of Christ in these women. But this way, my friends. Just as Paul commends Timothy, has been commending Timothy, and is an example of godly character, which flows from faith, which means just as the Apostle Paul commends Timothy as an example of faith for us, so the faith of his mother and grandmother are also an example to us because Timothy's faith has its roots in that of Lois and Eunice. Timothy has faith, and he's an example for us. Lois and Eunice have faith, and they are an example for us. Why? Because the faith 
that Timothy has, that's being commended for us, has flowed down from mother and grandmother so that Timothy would be in many ways the man that he is. And so the example of those who are an example to him becomes an example for us. Therefore, just as it was profitable for us to examine the various aspects of Timothy's faith, it will also be profitable for us to examine the mom and the grandmom's faith as well. And so just think of this as our goal this morning, that as we examine Lois and Eunice's faith, an examination of that will aid us in our efforts to grow a mind of Christ within ourselves. That's why we had the example of Timothy. Have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And here's a compelling and perfect example of Christ. And then here's an example, imperfect as it is, of this man, Timothy. Where'd Timothy get his from? Lois and Eunice. Well, let's look then at their faith to see what an example it could be for us that we might pursue that mind of Christ. And so the simple question is today, what characterizes the faith of Lois and and Eunice. Now, if you haven't turned there yet, please take your scriptures and turn to 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 5. I will be, or you will probably be surprised as I've been, at the amount that there is to glean from this one text of scripture. The Apostle Paul writing the last letter that we know that he wrote, I am reminded, he says in verse 5, speaking to Timothy, Timothy, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. What is it that characterizes Timothy's face? Well, there's all kinds. The first thing is that it characterizes his faith because it characterized Lois and Eunice's. This faith that he now has an example to us is number one, a personal faith. I am reminded of your sincere faith. It's, it's not something that he has not made his own. You've heard people say that, that we can't get by in our parents' faith. We can't get by in our pastor's faith. We can't get by on grandma's faith. No, no, we have to make it our own. We must have this personal. It's ours. We really do believe. And it's personal. It's ours. Paul says, I know it's yours. I know you believe these things. Number one, the faith that he has is a personal faith. Number two, it is a sincere faith. He says it just that clearly, doesn't he? I'm reminded of your sincere faith. That means something that's genuine. Timothy's belief in the Lord Jesus Christ is authentic. He's not playing games. He's not dealing in Christianese. He's not just giving the right Sunday school answers. No, no. When Paul looks back on this man, he thinks to himself, I'm reminded it's yours and it's sincere, genuine, real. And the third key thing at the outset is that it is a saving faith. I am reminded of your sincere faith. Why do I say saving faith? Because if you look down just at the next part of the passage, the Apostle Paul is going to make it very clear that the faith that Timothy has is a faith that saves. Look down at verse 8. We'll go down to verse 14. The Apostle Paul says, listen, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. Nor, or excuse me, because, let me try again. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in sufferings for the gospel, for the power of God. Now listen now, verse 9. Who, God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. And now, which now has been manifested or on display through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus who abolished death, who brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which, the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to him. So listen in verse 13. 
follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. Guard the good deposit entrusted to you. The Apostle Paul understands that it is a saving faith because it has been imparted into the man Timothy in such a personal way. And you see it moves very quickly from saving faith to a gospel displaying faith. Isn't that what's happening? Just, just think about how you can articulate the gospel of Christ. The beautiful articulation there of a God in verse 9 who has called us and called us to a holy calling. Not because of our works. Why? But because of his own purpose and grace which he gave us. He gave us. God so loved the world that he gave. The Lord Jesus Christ is pleased not to look at our works and say fail. He says fail but I will give you the righteousness that I earn by perfectly keeping the law. Looking at our debt and saying, unpayable. No, no, saying, unpayable. But I will pay the debt. And he goes to the cross in the place of a guilty sinner like you and like me. And the faith that Timothy has displays this gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ who abolished death and brought life and immortality through the gospel for which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher. And Paul, so Paul says, that's why I suffer this way. But I want you to follow the pattern of these sound words in the faith and the love that are in Christ Jesus by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. That's what happens when we're saved. The Holy Spirit takes up residence in this temple, in our hearts. This is the house of God, where God dwells, where God lives. And the Apostle Paul is saying, the faith that Timothy has, that was rooted in Lois and Eunice, is a saving faith, and it is a gospel-displaying faith. And it is, friends, also a living faith. It's alive. Look back in chapter 1 and verse 5. I am reminded of your sincere faith, your belief, your trust, your surrender in light of what you have seen of Christ. A faith that dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. It took up residence. That's where it lives. It's living and abiding. It, it's, it's alive. It's a faith that's growing. It's a faith that's changing. It's not sterile and as if it just reached out to cling to saving faith or reached out to cling to eternal life and now it's just sitting on a shelf. It's alive. It's real, it's growing, it's still dwelling there. It is a faith that is steadfast. It's lasted. It first began in a grandmother and a, and a mother and now a son. Lasted the difficult time. You have noticed, some of you, that there's no dad or granddad mentioned. As far as we know, Timothy's dad was an unbelieving Greek and there's no mention of his faith helping Timothy in fact in this day and age you, you've got to crawl back into this near eastern culture this is not the same as what some of you ladies have been able to do raise your child in the faith with the husband who's not interested it's extraordinarily difficult in these times impossible in a lot of situations perhaps his dad wasn't even on the scene after a few years but it's a steadfast faith because it's lasted through the challenges and the difficulties and the trials of the passing down from grandmother to mother to son. It's steadfast. It stood the, the challenges before it. It's lasted. It's still in Timothy to this day. It is a faith, friends, that was compelling. It was compelling because as it dwelt in Lois and Eunice, it was something that was lived out. And was picked up by the Apostle Paul. Not the Apostle then, of course. But you notice that it was not only compelling that Paul gleaned something of it and, and, and took it in. But this faith is noteworthy. Paul knows how significant it is. 
that he names these two gals in the pages of Scripture, encapsulated for all times. Not just, Timothy, I know of your saving faith that you had many years ago, rooted in your family somewhere, or doesn't even mention it. Think about how little or how seldom it's mentioned about the family connection in the scriptures where someone got their faith from. But this is a noteworthy, historically noteworthy kind of faith that is here in the scriptures for us. And it was a transferable faith, not just compelling, but it moved from these ladies into the heart of Timothy. It was transferable. Yes, some of you are thinking, well, I, I don't share my faith. I don't, I don't say anything about this. I, I just keep this to myself. It might affect my job. It might affect my education. Surely might affect my friendships. It might affect my marriage. It might affect my church. If I'm in a church that's not a gospel church. You know, I just, shh, just, just keep quiet. My, my faith is private. It's between me and God. Christian faith is not private, brothers and sisters. It is for certain personal. But that's not the same as being private. We are called all the time to go public with our faith. How will they possibly come to Christ unless they hear from you? All who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Romans chapter 10, right? But how will they call on one in whom they've not believed? And how will they believe in one of whom they've never heard? And how will they hear unless someone preaches to them? And how will they preach unless someone is sent? And that transferable nature of the faith of Lois and Eunice into the life of Timothy is a glorious, wonderful example for each one of us. And dear friends, it is a faith that is now expanding. Notice, notice there as the Apostle Paul is speaking about what's happening to Timothy. If you look back here in verse 5, I am reminded of your sincere faith, the faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I'm sure dwells in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the faith, no, no, the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. So Paul's not talking about his faith now. Timothy's faith has come through Lois and Eunice, not through the discipleship of the Apostle Paul or the evangelistic effort of the Apostle Paul. What has gone through the Apostle Paul is an understanding of the calling that God has laid upon Timothy. And that calling, that understanding of that calling, that picture of being set apart when you lay hands on someone as a commission. Now that faith is expanding in its scope and influence well beyond what women were allowed to do in this time and day and age. No way that Eunice and Lois were going to be accompanying the Apostle Paul on missionary journeys, teaching and preaching Jewish men and Gentile men and women. No, no, that just wouldn't have worked. But now it's expanding in its scope and in its influence, in its breadth and in its reach. It's live, it's alive, we said earlier, it's growing. And of course we said indeed that this faith that he has now and that is an example to us from these ladies is a biblical faith. It's rooted in the scriptures. Just look over at chapter 3 and, <clears throat> excuse me, verse 15. The Apostle Paul speaking of, of Timothy and his perseverance and how from childhood childhood with Lois and Eunice, how you from childhood had been acquainted with the sacred writings, with the scriptures, some of your versions say, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. The faith that they imparted to him was not merely their experience, was not because that's what their mama taught them, was not rooted in grandma's traditions. No, no, it was rooted 
in the tradition and what mama and grandma taught them from the Word of God. The faith that he has is a biblically rooted faith. And the interesting thing about this also, dear friends, though, is that it's a faith that's being threatened. In the sense, not that it's not certain and secure for eternity, but there's threats against it. There's attacks against it. There's assaults coming against this faith that they have indeed. Look back again at chapter 3 of 2 Timothy. And then let me give a bit of an extended reading. Because chapter 3, if you know this book, is prophesying about the difficulties that lay ahead for Timothy. And they say in chapter 3, verse 1, listen, understand this. In the last days there will come times of difficulty. People will be lovers of self, lovers of money. They'll be proud and arrogant. They'll be abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy. They'll be un heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. They will be having the appearance of godliness, but denying such power. Timothy, avoid such people. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women. Not like Eunice and Lois and Eunice, but those who creep into households, capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. The Apostle Paul goes on to speak about two men that we don't know who they are. They're not mentioned in the scriptures, but they are mentioned here as Jannes and Jambres, just as they oppose Moses. So these men also oppose the truth. These men that Timothy's dealing with. So these men also oppose the truth. Men corrupted in mind, disqualified regarding the faith. But they will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all, as it was of those two men. I mean, there's going to be people in the church who are phony faith, pretenders, charlatans, jackals in there amongst the sheep, ready to tear them apart. All kinds of interesting sayings, always learning, but never coming to a true knowledge of the truth, of the faith. This faith that Timothy has is a faith that's under attack, under assault. It's a faith that is threatened. And so in verse 10, you, Timothy, however, you have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, perseverance and sufferings that happened to me at Iconioc, at, at Antioch and Iconium and in Lystra, which persecutions I endured. Yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, Timothy, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Lois and Eunice could tell you a little something about that, Timothy. That while evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived, but... Timothy, this faith that you have, this biblically rooted faith, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Do you see that? You, you know who you've learned this from, Timothy. Do you see what an honor Lois and Eunice have in the scriptures here? How rock solid their faith was, transferring it to Timothy. But continue in what you've learned and what you've firmly believed. Don't take it for granted. Nurture it. Cling to it. Think about it. Understand that it's under assault, Timothy. And yet, it's a celebrated faith. The faith of Yolois and Eunice are being celebrated. For all time, their testimony about them is here in the scripture. And on a Mother's Day, we give thanks to God for his kindness through mothers. Mothers just like these gals who God was pleased to use here. He says it's a celebrated faith because you know from whom you learned it and how from childhood they did what they were called to do. They made sure that you had an understanding of who it was that you were to believe in. 
They made sure they spoke so that you heard and that you believed and that you would be saved. This is a faith that is being celebrated amongst these people. All of these years later, brothers and sisters, and, and particularly sisters this morning, I know your example is not absolutely perfect, but we can see the mind of Christ in women of Christ. And we can thank God on a Mother's Day for how he uses these ladies all the years to come to pass their truth their example of their truthful faithful steadfast concrete love for god shown in their fruitful their fruitful faith that they imparted to timothy a beautiful example for each one of us today let's pray dear god that these compelling examples would compel us to live in a way that's pleasing to our Lord. Let's pray. Father, I'm very thankful this day for look, looking at the incredible amount of weighty descriptions that you've given us of the example of these ladies, of the faith of the, these ladies, the example of belief, steadfast trust and surrender to Christ, and yet above all, dear God, we would be remiss if we did not recognize that the highest value of their faith is how it pointed Timothy to Christ and now he points us to Christ. And so dear God, would you, I pray, help us even throughout this Mother's Day to point one another to the Lord Jesus Christ and magnify his name amongst us. May we find our joy increased in Christ we ask, amen. Occupy.